Welcome to Lakeshore Community Church. We're so glad you're here with us. Why don't you go ahead and get on your feet? We're going to sing together this morning. In the morning when the sun is rising, another day to tell of all your kinds. When I think of your goodness, oh, I sing for joy and I speak for me. In the evening when the night is falling, when troubles rise and I can't hear you call, I don't have to worry, I won't be afraid, I speak the name, speak the name, speak the name that has power, speak the name, speak the name above all. See what you do. I give you all the glory. I give you all the praise. I speak the name.
Father, we know the truth of that song. We know that you are seated on the throne, that nothing can stand against us, Father, that when we, when we feel like we are living in a world that's just full of chaos, that we can cling to that truth, that you are still seated on the throne, that you reign over all of it, and that when we feel like the war is, ra is, is raging and the storms are raging around us, Father, we can lean into you and we can trust that we can stand on you as our foundation that does not shake, does not move. I just pray, Father, that you would just keep reminding us of that each and every day, that you go before us and that you're not surprised. We thank you, Father, for who you are. Tremble, 
A shout let's give him a shout of praise come on church lift it up amen amen father thank you so much that you are the one who makes the darkness tremble that you are the one who moves through every part of our lives that no matter what we're going through you have already gone before us and you have already been given the victory and Jesus we thank you we praise you in this place and we shout together amen let's give him one more shout of praise come on amen well, it's so great to see you guys. Before you take your seat, say hi to somebody. <laughs> Amen. Oh, it's so good to see you guys. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here. We're thrilled you're spending part of your weekend with us. If this is your first time here, maybe your first time in a while, I want to personally welcome you. If you guys are tuning in online, welcome to you as well. Let our hosts know where you're watching from. We would love to say hello. And uh, we've been reaching people all around the world. We just love to hear where you're watching from and so excited that you're here. Now, if this is, like I said, your first time or first time in a while, I want you to do something for us. We say this every single week. Go to your app store, download the Lakeshore app, this is not for us to be cool, not for us to be trendy, but we really believe that this is a tool that will help you in your spiritual growth. If you have any questions, if you want to stay connected with the church, see what's happening, maybe go back and watch some services on demand, or maybe you just simply had a question, want to get in touch with us. That's the best way for you to do that. But if this is your first time here or your first time watching, download that app, click the connect button at the bottom. Let us know that you're here for the first time. We would love to say hello. We have a hassle-free, stalker-free guarantee. We're not going to show up at your door. We're not going to be weird, I promise but we just want to say hello and be a resource for you. 
So we are continuing in our series called How It All Ends. It's been an absolutely fascinating series. I hope it's been helpful for you guys, as I know it has been for so many of us. Just the questions that we're constantly asking and what we see what scripture says about what will truly happen. And our senior pastor, Pastor Vince DiPaolo, is going to be up here in just a moment as we continue on in that series. But before we do that, I want you to check out Lakeshore News. What's up, everyone? My name is Dave, and I serve on our creative team. And thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. And we understand that God has called us to help people experience God's grace, grow spiritually, connect relationally in groups, and ultimately find how their gifts can impact this world. It's our goal to share God's love with everyone. And in Lakeshore Kids, we teach your kids about the God that loves them in an exciting, age-appropriate, and safe environment. If you want to keep your kids with you, the back rows with the orange seat covers are for you. And we have an area in the atrium for families with young kids. We want to create a distraction-free environment in the auditorium, and we know sometimes our little ones can get uncomfortable. Our guest services team is here to help you make an easy transition from the auditorium. And if you have kids in middle school, our Lakeshore students meet during our 11 a.m. service. And here they get to be with other teens, play games, and hear God's word uh, in a way that they can understand and apply in their school life. And just go to lakeshorestudents.org for more information and to see any Lakeshore students events coming up. We want to help you go deeper and grow deeper in your faith. And that's why we offer our midweek Bible study on the first and third Thursday at 7 p.m. And this is a time for us to dig into the Bible and learn how to apply it into our lives in a real and practical way. This Thursday, our senior pastor, Vince DiPaolo, will be teaching as we continue in our series, Romans, Just by Faith. You can go to lakeshorechurch.org to learn more about midweek or to watch previous midweek Bible studies on demand. And if you are new to Lakeshore or want to learn more in depth about who we are as a church and what we believe, there's no better way than attending our Discover classes. On Discover Lakeshore, you'll hear from our senior pastor about some of the ins and outs of the ministry uh, learn details about our beliefs, our leadership, and how we intentionally organize our church. You will also have the opportunity to become a Lakeshore member. Our next class is available online right now, followed by a meet and greet with Pastor Vince. For more information or to sign up, visit lakeshorechurch.org. Once again, we are so excited that you made it today. And to find out more information or to sign up for anything coming up, go to lakeshorechurch.org or just stop by our Next Steps area in the atrium right after service. We are so excited for the Fall Fest. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be on Sunday, October 31st from 1230 to 2.30. There's going to be a lunch. And candy. And games. And candy. And crafts. And candy. You can wear a costume. Go to lakeshorechurch.org backslash fallfest to register your family, invite family and friends, and sign up to volunteer. And it's okay if you wear your costume to Lakeshore Kids that morning. Hey, guess what else? We need candy! You can drop off individually wrapped candy in the crates by the Lakeshore Kids check-in. See you there! Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Little fall in the air. A little brisk out there. A little pumpkin spice latte feel. Hope you're all doing well. How does it all end? That's the subject that we have begun a couple weeks ago in this series by that title, How It All Ends. And it's an important question. People are asking the question more and more. They're seeing things happening in the world. They're watching the news. They're seeing what Governments are doing, people are doing, and it's raising questions because 
things are getting as tough and as difficult and as bad as we've seen in some time. And uh, they're rightfully asking the question. Thankfully, in the, great, the greatness of God, God has virtually all the answers. He certainly has all the answers we need. While God doesn't tell us exactly when he'll come, he tells us exactly how it will happen just before he comes. And that's how we began this series. Remember, we began this series with week one. How close are we? And we could not give you a definitive answer because God wouldn't give us a definitive answer. By the way, why wouldn't God give us a definitive answer? You know exactly why, right? Because if he told us a date, everybody would live it up, go crazy, and then about 72 hours before the date, oh, they'd act all good, right? They figured they could do it for 72 hours, right? So God doesn't give us the date, but he gives us the signs. Remember the fig tree sign, when the branch gets tender, when the flower buds, you know, summer is near, similarly. And we see the signs of how close we are. Matthew 24, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all the signs Israel, the signs of um, one world governmentism, which we'll see a lot of today, just all these different signs. That was the least precise in terms of date, but lots of signs. Then last week we talked about the blessed hope, this amazing event called the rapture. It's what we all look for. If you're a Christian, that's what you look for. That's why it's called the blessed hope, the great appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, which is one of the proof texts, by the way, that shows that Jesus Christ is God our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what's the rapture going to be like? At some point, right, unknown, nobody knows when, suddenly, like a thief in the night, Jesus will come, and what's going to happen? Who will rise first, if you remember from last week? The dead will, in, in Christ, will rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Remember I said the imagery from that um, <clears throat> superhero is uh, it, the rapture is like the bat pole in reverse, right? Did you tell all your friends that you learned about the bat pole at church? Were your friends impressed? Were they wowed? Did they think I was cool? No, so that's, that's the rapture, that great event. It's going to happen in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, right? That, that, that 186,000 miles per second traveling of light. But that's a mile, and, and it's all, all twinkling is how fast light goes, shoo, you know, through your eye. It's like, boom, billionth of a second. The rapture. It's an amazing event, but the rapture is only for who? Christians. That's an easy one, right? For Christians. So what happens if you miss the rapture? What happened? Yeah, that was a rhetorical question. That's what I'm going to talk about today. But you're right. It's going to, what's going to happen is this seven-year period. But we're going to talk about that. Because when the rapture occurs, every true believing Christian will be taken. One second after the rapture, how many Christians are on the planet? Zero. Correct. And this will introduce... And, and by the way, it's, it's not exactly, if you study the Bible and you see this different events, it's not exactly like the rapture occurs, boom, the seven year begins. There's a, we're going to see how it begins, but there's a short period of time. And today we're going to look at the seven year tribulation, the most difficult time in the history of the world. And it will never be as difficult again. So take out your notes if you have them. You can grab them on the way in. And it's, it's great because um, I think last week we ran out, which you know, I feel bad for those who missed out, but... But you ever hear people say this, boy, my life is as hard as H-E double hockey sticks, right? Or I feel like I've been to H-E double hockey sticks and back. By the way, the hockey stick is like an L for those of you who don't know hockey. <laughs> you ever notice a lot of people direct people to this destination, right? You do something wrong, why don't you go to beep? The truth is, Nothing has happened in your life, my life, or anybody's life that is as terrible and terrifying as the seven-year tribulation. This will literally be hell on earth. Now, before we look at it, let's look at our amazing timeline. Isn't this amazing? Such an amazing... So, let's go from left to right. Remember, this is time. And the first thing is the cross of Christ, his death, resurrection, and ascension... And right now, we are in the church age, in that gold. That's where we are now. People want to say, are you at the A, are you at the G? We're certainly not at the T-H-E or C-H-U-R-C-H. 
We're, we're toward the end of the church age. By the way, why is it called the church age? Because God, God's ultimate plan, and this is important, God's ultimate plan centers around the nation of Israel. God's ultimate plan centered around Israel being a light to the world to help redeem the whole world through Israel. So the church age is like a, a scholars call it a parenthesis. In other words, God puts a pause focusing exclusively on Israel. He's always focused on Israel, but exclusively, and now he opened it up to non-Jewish people. The Bible calls it Gentiles and the church age. The church is made up of Jew and Gentile, by the way. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22 talks about that. We're there. And then last week we talked about the rapture of the church, right? And we just, by the way, we differentiated between the rapture of the church and the second coming, right? Completely different events separated by the seven, seven year period. We're going to talk right now about that right in the center, that red, the seven year tribulation. See, there's a midpoint. It's important. Because what we're going to do is we're going to look at four aspects of the seven-year tribulation. We're going to look right at, right at the first point, right underneath the clouds, how it starts. Then we're going to talk about the first three and a half years. Then we're going to talk about the midpoint. And then we're going to talk about the final three and a half years. That's basically my four points. Those are the four different aspects of the seven-year tribulation that the Bible has a definitive characterization of. In other words... Um, the demarcations of time are how it begins, first three and a half years, the midpoint, and the last three and a half years, and how it ends. By the way, we're going to talk about how it ends two weeks later when we talk about the second coming of Christ. Man, that's going to be a pump-me-up, exciting day. Not that today's going to be miserable, right? No miserable. We're just learning the truth. So we're going to look at each one. But let me just say this before we jump in. I want to remind you that God has the right to judge the world. For thousands of years, the human race has defied, rejected, ignored, and rebelled against him as a human race. That's you and me, too. It's every single one of us. We've slapped God in the face with the way we live. We spit in his face with the way we treat him and treat each other. And God has the right to judge the world. People, oh, how could God, how could a loving God do this? Here's a better question. How could human beings be so callous toward a holy, righteous God? That's the better question. So, as we cover some of this, um, remember that if you reject Jesus Christ, I mean, the most gracious gift that's available by grace alone through faith alone, God has the right to do this. God has the right to do anything he wants, but he certainly has the right to do this. But more on that in a bit. So let's talk about how it starts. How does the seven-year tribulation start? The Bible is as clear as day. It begins with a treaty between Antichrist and Israel. An individual known as Antichrist and the nation of Israel, which again, from the time of Abraham forward, Israel is God's focus and attention. Now a little bit of background. Israel is God's chosen people since Abraham. Abraham is the father of three groups of people. We're going to see this fascinatingly in a moment. Abraham is the father of all Jewish people through his son Isaac. He's the father of all Arab people through his son Ishmael. And who is, who is the third group of people Abraham is the father of? Christians, spiritually speaking, because Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness in, in uh, Genesis 12. And therefore, spiritually, Christians are descendants of Abraham. That's the three branches. Keep that in mind because we're going to see how, unfortunately, that's going to be manipulated. Uh, and we're seeing it in the news today. But more on that in a minute. Israel is where all conflicts are centered right now. The world increasingly hates Israel. And that's biblical. Not that their hate is biblical, but it's predicted in the Bible is maybe a better way to put it. Israel was destroyed as a nation in 70 AD. Remember we talked about that in week one under General Titus. And yet it was reconstructed and reformed as a nation in May of 1948. Think about that. 1878 years later, a nation reconstitutes. Never happened in history. But it had to happen 
to set the stage for the end. And notice how it starts. Notes, Revelation, not, excuse me, Daniel 9.27a, that is the first part. He, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. <laughs> Whoa. All right, three parts, so let me unpack it. First, he, the Antichrist. Let me talk, who is the Antichrist? Talked about a lot in the Bible. He is the future one world leader. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament, the book of Revelation in the New Testament, by the way, they they fit together. They're the two most detailed books about the end times. They teach that there will be a one-world government that will come from Europe. Now, the Bible doesn't say Europe. The Bible says it will come from the revived Roman Empire. Now, a little bit of history. The Egyptian army was replaced by the Assyrian army. The Assyrians replaced by the Babylonians. The Babylonians replaced by the Medo-Persians. Medo-Persians replaced by the, by the, the Greeks. The Greeks replaced by the Romans. The Roman Empire wasn't replaced by anybody. Anybody. You know why? Because the Roman Empire collapsed upon itself with immorality. I'm sorry to tell you the same immorality we're seeing in our country. It mirrors scary. But I say that because of this. The Roman Empire, the, the Daniel tells us this, Revelation tells us, will be revived. What is the Roman Empire? It's basically Europe. That's why it was very fascinating when the European Union formed in the 80s. Fascinating. Because the Bible says the Antichrist will take root by ruling over ten kings in the revived Roman Empire. So it doesn't matter. Don't worry about the European Union doesn't have ten. It's got thirteen. Don't worry about it. There will ultimately be ten, and Antichrist will rule from his base in Europe. Now, you hear the name Antichrist, and you think, oh, he's, he's the devil. You know, of course he is. He's energized. He's not literally, but he's energized. But I want you to know, he's going to be someone who's going to appear very winsome, charismatic, kind of like me. <laughs> Just trying to bring a little levity. Intelligent, well-received as a political leader. He is going to be super-duper. I mean, everybody's going to be going, He did what nobody else could do with Israel. He will be a Gentile, not a Jew. Now, that's interesting because the Jewish people who are faithful, if they're observant and or orthodox or both, they expect the Messiah still to come, that he'll be Jewish, but the Antichrist will be a Gentile. And yet, many will be deceived to thinking maybe he's the Messiah. With his political clout, he will do something. He will confirm a covenant with many. Now, the Bible unpacks this covenant or treaty, think treaty, is a seven-year pact that the Antichrist brokers to protect Israel from her enemies. I mean, we know right now Iran, Russia are in partnership to come against Israel. China hates Israel. There's so many nations that most of the Arab world hates Israel. I mean, there are Fortunately, some moderates like Egypt and Jordan where, where, and, and others that are moderate and they don't have this um, ant, uh, antagonistic view toward Israel. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the nations have in their constitution death to Israel, like in their constitution. So um, he will broker this peace treaty, but it will not be long-lasting as we're going to see in point three, and it will be for one seven. That's what it, and it says, for one seven. That's literally what the Bible says, for a seven. Now, we know from other texts, we know from the context that it means one seven means seven years. One seven years. One seven-year period. So that's how the seven-year tribulation begins, when the Antichrist brokers a peace treaty on behalf of Israel and the nations. And of course... Look at the world trying to solve this. I mean, the world had a cow when President Trump, rightfully, I might add, moved um, the the capital um, for ambassadors from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, where it belongs. I mean, the world had a cow over that, but um, that's where it belongs. Now, do we know who the Antichrist is right now? No, we don't. No, it's not one of your relatives. We don't know who it is. Is he alive right now? If we're close, the answer is yes, he is. He absolutely is. But we don't know. 
for sure. We're only going to know his identity at the start of the seven-year tribulation. We will not know. So you can speculate all you want. We will not know until the seven-year peace treaty is brokered by the individual. Then we'll know. By the way, will we know? Well, if you're a Christian, you won't because you'll be in heaven. You won't be here to know. You won't care. Notice uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says, Don't let anyone deceive you. By the way, lots of deceiving going on today. In any way, for that day will not come. That is what day? The day of the Lord, which is what? A thousand and seven years long. But the day of the Lord begins with the seven-year tribulation, which begins with the Antichrist peace. That day will not come. That period won't even start until three things. The rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Let's break down those three parts. First, until the rebellion occurs. Until the rebellion occurs. The Greek word is apostasia. It can be translated until the apostasy occurs. Does it sound like a negative word? It is. Apostasy literally, apostasy literally means to fall away. Until the falling away occurs. Lots of speculation about this. This is, again, remember I told you, I'm not, when I don't know for sure, I'm not going to, I personally believe the best interpretation is that the apostasy or falling away is that the church falls away from the truth. Well, think about it. When every Christian is taken from the earth, how many Christians are left? Zero. So all the churches are run by people who don't believe in Jesus Christ. That's the apostasy. That's what I believe. Whether that's the case here or not, what I said beyond that is true. Therefore, this seems to compart with that very well. There will be a false professing church that abandons the truth of the Bible. Is this happening today? Oh, my gosh. It's disgusting. I want you to see this Fox News story right here. Um, I don't know if, if the team can pick it up or bring it up. I think they're going to do that now. This is a picture. It was in Fox News. Here's the title of the article. A church, a synagogue, and a mosque to share interfaith complex in Abu Dhabi. Now, the plan is to unite the Jewish religion, the Muslim religion, and the Christian religion together into one. It's called the Abrahamic family house. What did I say Abraham's the father of? Every Jew, every Arab, and every Christian spiritually. So under the guise of Abraham, poor Abraham getting blamed for this, um, this was followed, this occurred because Pope Francis met with the grand imam Ahmed al Tayyib, and uh, who's a Muslim. And in 2022, they're going to um, complete their first initiative as a committee. And in the, in, the, in the story, it said this. I forgot who said it. It says, this is a profoundly moving moment for humanity. Little do they know. People say, oh, this is so good. Can't we all get along? Isn't this wonderful? Well, that's like saying, look, Uncle Eddie gets drunk all the time. Uncle Eddie punches his wife. Let's just let it happen. Uncle Eddie's going to be Uncle Eddie. No, you don't. You confront Uncle Eddie. And this is what the world's world says. Let's stop arguing. And I do that Mamby Pamby voice. You know that's not good. <laughs> How could a Roman Catholic pope, supposedly representing Jesus Christ as God and Lord, unite two religions that overtly and completely reject that Jesus is God. This is going to set the stage for the one world government. This is happening today, but after the rapture with no Christians, with churches led by non-Christians who profess faith in Christ but don't possess faith in Christ. And I want to say that right now. There's a lot of people who profess faith in Christ, but they do not truly possess faith in Christ. That's why Jesus says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't I do this? Lord, didn't I do that? Lord, didn't I do that? By the way, the three things he says is the stuff you see on three quarters of the shows on TBN. Right? We did miracles, cast out demons. Blah, blah, blah. And Jesus says, depart from me. 
I never knew you. See, just because somebody says Jesus, that doesn't make them a Christian. Second, the second phrase that I want to focus on is the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's the Antichrist character. He's a lawbreaker. He doesn't follow laws. He follows his own laws. He will, we will finally see who he is when he brokers a seven-year treaty. He's so lawless that breaking the treaty, that's nothing to him. It's his character. He's lawless. By the way, what does Satan call? The fa- Jesus called Satan who? The father of lies. Who is the Antichrist? The lawless one. Why? Because Satan energizes Antichrist. By the way, the rebellion or the apostasy represents the religious side of the end times. The Antichrist represents what? The political side of the end times. How does God exist? God exists in triunity, does he not? We believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You think Satan thinks God is brilliant? Of course he does. He just hates him, but he knows he's brilliant. So what does God, or so what does Satan do? He has his unholy trinity. The beast is Satan. The Antichrist is the political leader. And the false prophet is the religious leader. The unholy trinity of the end times. There will be a merging between the political and the religious. By the way, I'm not going to cover it today, but just a little bit of background. The false prophet... By the way, people say this religious leader will be the Antichrist. No, it, the religious leader will not be the Antichrist. The religious leader will be the false prophet. And the religious leader will go, oh, Antichrist is the man. You've got to listen to him. There'll be a merging between the political and the religious. It's the worst thing you can do. What makes America great, you know, people say America is a Christian nation. Never was a Christian nation. America was a Judeo-Christian value-informed nation. There's only one Christian nation, and we're going to learn about that in a few weeks when Jesus comes back. We're not a Christian nation, but we are a nation based on Judeo-Christian values. That's undeniable. But, but it's, it would be wrong to call us a Christian nation. But when we fall away, what's going to happen is, uh, but, but what makes America great, here's my point, is that we believe in separation of church and state. Now, that's been vastly misunderstood. Keep the church out of the state. It's ridiculous. That's not ex- that's, it's the exact opposite. The whole purpose of separation of church and state is to keep the state out of the church. Remember, that's why they left England. So it is not to keep the church out of the state. John Quincy Adams says the Constitution is incapable of governing an immoral and ungodly people. It just doesn't work. You've got to have morals to follow our precious and beautiful Constitution. So there will be a marriage between the two. And then finally it says he will be doomed to destruction. He will only have seven years to operate and cause chaos. So that's how it begins. Can you see the early signs now? What do you think? I can. Israel in need of help today? Yeah, see that. False churches around today? Yeah. World looking for a one world leader? There are people, billionaires, who are working for a board. Why do you think, I'm not gonna get political, I'm just gonna get observant. Why do you think the southern border is open? Because we love people? No. It's because people want a borderless, one-world planet. Not good. Now, the first three and a half years usher in God's seal judgments. Now, I'm going to go through these quickly because um, they're called seal judgments because in Revelation 4 to 5, we see this scroll. The scroll represents the title deed to the earth. Scrolls were sealed on the side so that as you opened it, you would break a seal. As you opened it in phases, and each seal would be progressively broken. And that's a picture of what he's going to do. God's going to un... The the scroll is a picture of the title deed of the earth. Jesus Christ owns the earth and the world. And as he unrolls the scroll, the seals break, and he will unroll his judgment, proving he has the right to rule the earth. And these seven seal judgments are um, revealing God's judgment on the world. So let's go through them each. It's, it, it, this is a big tech block quote in your notes, so we'll just follow along. It says, I watched as the Lamb, and the Lamb is Jesus Christ, opened the first of the seven seals. A white horse with its rider had a bow and was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, this is the most misunderstood. Who is the rider on the white horse? Some people say, oh, it's Jesus. No, it couldn't be Jesus. It doesn't fit the chronology, and it doesn't even fit the context. Everything else is negative, negative, negative. Why would the first thing be positive? It's not Christ. It's 
Antichrist. Then it says, a white, he's rider on a white horse. Now, when a Roman emperor had a victory, he would ride a white horse with those he conquered behind him. And it would be a picture of triumph. That's a picture of Antichrist. And then it says this, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on contrast, but it says its rider had a bow. Notice what it doesn't say he had? It doesn't say he had an arrow. No, all he's got is the bow. He's got the threat. So he's not going to take power by war. He's going to take power by what? He's going to rise to power in Europe. He's going to take power by brokering the peace treaty. So he's got a bow, but he doesn't have an arrow. And then it says he's given a crown. Oh, it's got to be Jesus. No. There's actually two words for crown in the New Testament. The Greek word here is stephanos. It means a victor's crown. Yeah, he won the victory of ruling the world for seven years. The crown that Jesus has always assigned is not stephanos, but another Greek word, diadema, or diadema. We, we, we sing that song, bring forth a royal diadem. You know, I'm not going to try to sing it any more than that. You'll be out of here. So, kind of like the rapture. But Jesus crowns a different crown. Can't be speaking of Jesus. So the first seal will be Antichrist's arrival. The second seal, another horse. Remember the first, well, not remember. The first four are in the form of horsemen. So you ever hear the expression, the four horsemen of the apocalypse? The second seal, another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. If the first rider of the horse is Antichrist, the second rider of the horse is War and bloodshed. War and bloodshed. Takes peace from the earth. It gets people to kill each other in war. It's, and notice it says it was given a large sword. I mean, this, this will be a violent series of wars. It's not talking about Armageddon. It's talking about the nature of multiple fierce wars during the seven-year tribulation. Armageddon's coming. We'll talk about that in a second. By the way, it's empowered by Satan because it's a fiery red horse. Uh, Revelation 12, 3, the red dragon is Satan. And Revelation uh, 17, 3, the scarlet or red beast is Satan. So there's going to be lots of war between people and nations. The scroll is opening. Here's seal number three. The third seal is a black horse. The rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wage. Six pounds of barley for a day's wage. And then the strange statement, and do not damage the oil and the wine. That's random. Maybe not. The third symbolizes famine and hyperinflation. Famine and hyperinflation. See, we see a lot of inflation now. Is this going to be the inflation that leads to the end? I don't know. We've had inflation before. You don't know. But this inflation will be peanuts. Consider this. This is how expensive food will be. Two pounds of wheat for a day's wage. You know how much food you can make out of two pounds of wheat? One really good meal. You think about that. You'll have to work all day, and you'll get one meal from it. I mean, forget about two meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Forget about paying your RG&E, your mortgage. Then it says six pounds of barley for a day's work. Well, six pounds of barley gets you three meals, but it's not as nutritious. All for a day's wage. Staggering. And then it says, no damage to the oil and wine. The best, I, know, I read a lot of commentary. What it is, is what's oil and wine? That's the rich person's food. What does that mean? Don't, don't, don't touch the rich people's food. In other words, the rich will have the authority and the food and the power and the control, and the poor will be squashed, which has happened quite often in history, and that's another reason why God judges the world this way. That's the third seal, famine and hyperinflation. Then the fourth seal, this is the fourth of the uh, fourth horse. The fourth seal is a pale horse. Its rider is named Death and Hades. Well, I don't have to interpret it for you. I mean, John, based, who wrote Revelation, told us the fourth seal is Death and Hades. What's Hades? Hell was followed close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, 
famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. There will be radically high totals of death. It naturally follows war and famine. When there's war and famine, there's death. I want you to think about what was said. I've read it over casually, I suppose. But listen to this. One quarter of the earth dies. The earth's population right now is approximately 7.9 billion. I want you to think about this. And this is just the beginning. This fourth seal says a quarter of the earth, 2 billion people. (coughs) Dead. That's the fourth seal. The fifth seal moves from horses, and it says the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. The fifth seal, if you want a word for it, it's it's martyrdom. People will die for believing in Jesus in the end. You go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said there are no Christians right after the rapture, right? But people become Christians during the seven-year tribulation. More detail on that in Revelation chapter 7. You can become a Christian. You know, you can go, well, you know what? I'll just see if this is true and I'll wait till after the rapture. You might be thinking that. I hope you're not. Um, I suppose you could do that. But boy, it'll be hard. It'll be really, really hard to be a Christian then. I pray to God, and we'll talk about this at the end, that you do business with God before then. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? This is a picture of Christians who die. By the way, Christians are being martyred today. Martyred today, all over the world. Paying the ultimate price for believing in Jesus. And we get a little nervous when somebody says we're a Christian around somebody when, on the golf course. Oh, well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not into that. I'm not, you know, stop it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't be afraid to say that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing. Thank you. Don't be ashamed of that. People aren't, they live so sinfully and they're not ashamed of that. And we're going to be ashamed of a holy God. Stop. We got to stop that. Then each of them was given a white robe. What is that? Why is, what, and we're going to see this in the series later. A white robe is a picture of righteousness. When you become a Christian, God so forgives you. He declares you righteous, and the white robe is a picture of God's declaring of a Christian forgiven and righteous. And they were told to wait a little longer. What does that mean? There will be more martyrs. There will be martyrs all the way through the seven-year period until the number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. The fifth seal martyred Christians. Again, a quarter of the world and the fourth seal are going to be wiped out. Here's more. Just because a quarter is going to be wiped out, there's there's going to be increasing numbers. You're going to see this again and again and again. Then the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. And you're just going to see six cataclysmic events. A great earthquake. The sun turned to black like the sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned to blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens recede like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Well, some people say, oh, that's figurative. No, it's not. can't be. It's literal. How can you go literal, 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 figurative, literal? I mean, people say that. Oh, the book of Revelation, it's just symbolic. So it's symbolic until Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back, then it's literal? Come on, that's, that's ridiculous. Either it's all literal or it's all a fairy tale. I certainly hope you don't believe the latter. So the uh, the sixth seal is cosmic and celestial events. So let me summarize. The six seals are antichrist, wars, famine, death, martyrdom, and cosmic chaos. The rest of Revelation 6 says that God's wrath will be so severe that people in that day will beg God, will beg God to drop rocks on them so they stop existing. That's how horrific it will be. Can you imagine that? Just kill me. Take me out. Drop a rock on me. I want this to be over. That's hell on earth. It'll be everyone's worst day times 10 quadrillion. Why? Again, because the world has rejected God, and God says enough is enough. Now, third key time frame is 
at three and a half years, Antichrist brazenly breaks the treaty. So it's a seven-year treaty, but right at the three and a half year mark by the Jewish calendar, boom, he breaks the treaty. Daniel 9, 27, B, the second half, of, we read A in, a minute ago. In the middle of the seven, the seven-year treaty, he, Antichrist, will put an end to sacrifice and offering. By the way, that, that's, what, is, what does that mean, to put an end to sacrifice and offering? Well, it's not happening now, but it tells you what. In the end times, Israel will rebuild the temple. Old Testament Levitical animal sacrifices will be taking place in the temple. At three and a half years into that, Antichrist ends it. And how does he end it? Look at the rest. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. In other words, for the next, for the final three and a half years, what happens? He goes into the most holy place where only the high priest once a year, on behalf of himself, the nation, and everything, made sacrifice. And it's called the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place in the temple, small place where um, the Ark of the Covenant, um, which included Arid's rod, the Ten Commandments, and the manna inside the Ark of the Covenant. He went to make sacrifice for the people. Antichrist goes, I'm going in the Holy of Holies. I'm God. Now his real intentions come out. Now he's not so winsome and popular anymore. And that's the abomination that causes desolation. What does that mean? God says, whoo hoo, okay. I knew this was coming. I knew it was coming from the beginning of the world, but now it's going to bring a desolation even worse. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 adds more details. Look at what it says. It says, He, the Antichrist, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. I'm the king. And he is a pseudo-leader of the world for three and a half years. Because God's always in control. How many know that? I mean, Satan may... Ha- Satan, put it this way. Satan may have power, but he's like a dog on a leash. And God says, this is where the leash will go, and this is how far it will extend. So Satan can do some things, but never outside the purview of God. It's not like God goes, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Satan's doing? Come on. Satan's never had any power apart from God allowing it. So that he sets himself in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. It's been Satan's goal ever since he fell from the garden. I hope you know this if you don't. When God created the angel, Satan was a fallen angel. Why? He led worship in heaven. He hated God, tried to oppose God. God kicked him out. One third of the angelic host fell with him. You can read about that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Very difficult passage to read, but, it's, but, but metaphorically it pictures a king then and also the fall of Satan at the same time. But the final three and a half years, Satan will try to run the world. God's judgment gets more intense. And then notice Revelation 13, 16 to 18 says one last thing about this period. It also, forced, it, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, you get the idea, to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead. This is what you hear all about. We're going to explain it and stop the insanity. There's so many stupid things said about this. Right hand and the forehead so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name, but for it is the number of a man. So it's the name, it it's, it's involves the beast, his name, and the number of man. The number is 666. And let me say a few things about this, because there's a lot of hysteria. I was playing golf with a friend, and, and he was saying, oh, these people are saying, you know, if you get the vaccine, that's the mark of the beast. That's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. A few things. Number one, this happens when? After the rapture, three and a half years in. How can, it's ridiculous to say the vaccine is the mark of the beast. If you receive the mark of the beast, you will willfully and knowledgeably understand you're pledging your allegiance to Satan. You'll know it. I mean, there's no mistaking And, of course, because it happens, it can't be the vaccine. No. Let me be real clear again. At this church, 
We have no policies on masks or vaccines except this. Whatever God leads you to do, do it. Nobody will judge you for having or not having the vaccine. Nobody will judge you for masks or no masks. If it happens, we got a problem, and we're going to talk about it. There's no judging here. But here's what I believe. This is, again, opinion. I told you I'll tell you what is opinion. Here's what I believe. I believe these mandates, everybody get the vaccine. I believe it's conditioning the world for everybody get the mark. That's an opinion. But I believe a lot of things, like we saw in week one, a lot of signs, they start happening now, but they fully manifest in the end. That's my opinion. So you don't have to believe that. But that's what I think. But the, what I want to focus on, 666, what is that? I'm not going to give you a definitive answer, but I'm going to give you some parameters to think it through. Number one, six is the number of man. Why is that? Anybody know? What day of creation was man created? Sixth. That's the number of man. And then it says 666. We covered this, I think, last week or the week before. What does three represent? Number of perfection. So man is six. A full week is seven. Six falls short of seven perfectly. Six, six, six. Man falls short, man falls short, man falls short. He perfectly falls short. That's the mark. The mark is the symbol of you perfectly fall short, Satan. And so do you human beings if you don't put your faith in me. Now, what could the 666 be? This is speculation. Here's one possibility. How many digits do we have in our social security number? Nine. How many digits do we have in our zip code? Nine. Now, the world may or not have that. What's nine plus nine? Eighteen. What's six plus six plus six? I believe the mark of the beast will be universal in one sense and personalized in another, like a credit card. Your credit, you have a Discover card. It's all the Discover card, but you got your own number, and I think it'll be personalized. Could it be that? speculation. We don't know. But what I believe is it will clearly be a uniform trading system. You want to buy or sell? Got to have it. You go, Vince, how will Christians survive in the end times? They won't be able to buy or sell. They'll live off the land. People will kindly give them. I don't know. God might provide. I don't know. But they will survive. But the world will plunge into even deeper hell on earth. Now let me just cover the last three and a half years and wind this this thing down. The last three and a half years bring God's most severe judgment. You can see in your notes, just skip below Matthew, the, the trumpet and bowl judgments. Um, I have a list here. Time keeps me from reading it. You can read them on your own. It goes from a quarter to a third to all. I mean, things get destroyed. But here's the best summary is Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 21 to 22. For then there will be a great distress. Talking about what? The final three and a half years. Unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Nothing will compare to the hell on earth in the final three and a half years. If those days had not been cut short, implied by God himself, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Who's the elect? People become Christians during the tribulation. People say, how do people come to Christ during the tribulation? Let me give you four thoughts on this real quickly. Number one, some people know the gospel, know about the rapture. They see, you know, 10, 15%, 20% of the world at most disappear. And they go, ooh, that was that rapture thing. And they become Christians. Other people hear the gospel, and then they finally put it together. Here's a second. The Bible says there will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists that share the faith, Revelation 7. Uh, Revelation 11 says another way is there are two dead witnesses. They'll, they'll come back to life, and that will be a picture of, um, of the power of God. And then finally, as people become Christians during the tribulation, they share with others. So there are many, many ways this will happen. And again, the trumpet judgments and sealed and bold judgments, they end. Now, I don't know if we've got a chart of it. Um, this is what the chronology looks like. The seal judgments occur. The, why didn't I cover the seventh seal? Because the seventh seal unleashes the trumpet judgments. So most people believe the seals are the first three and a half. Some people believe it's the whole seven. The trumpet judgments, which you can read about on your own, are the second half. 
The bowl judgments are right at the end. They're just gatling gun, rapid fire, bum, 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 right at the end. So that's the chronology. Again, there's some debate about it, but what is not debatable is that the seventh seal opens to the trumpets and the seventh trumpet opens to the bowl. You can, you can adjust the timing of it, and, and, and there's reasonable debate allowed on that, but this is clearly what, and you can see all those judgments. Can we get that up on snap face or whatever? Can we do that? All right, we're going to, I'm going to say they said yes. I can't ever see them. But. And, and, and through all of this, um, here's the point. Satan will be given a little bit of power, and God will judge the earth. But the good news is at the end of the seven years, Jesus comes back. We're going to talk about that in two weeks. You go, what are we going to talk about next week? Next week, we're going to talk about what happens when you die. You think it's simple? It's not so simple. What happens when you die? We're going to talk about that. So how do we prepare? I know we went a little bit long. It's had a lot of details. Let me give you a couple of things. Number one, be 100% sure that you are committed to Christ. Don't be left behind. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, We ought, Paul speaking to the Christians of Thessalonica, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in the truth. Make Sure, you are a Christian. The most terrifying experience in the universe is to think you're a Christian, stand before the living God, and discover you're not. Horrifying. Don't be that person. Please be sure. Don't leave this earth. I think I'm a Christian. I don't I, yeah. It has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ did. And when you put your faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, you're forgiven. Make sure. Don't be left behind. Second, whenever and wherever, share your faith. We were playing golf on Friday, and me and my friend were like, and I, I, my friend Jim Pesky, his son Dave and, and daughter-in-law Karen back there. You know what I love about Jim? When we play golf, we're always trying to share our faith with people. Lenny, my golf instructor, um, we're always trying to share our faith. Always trying to share our faith. Because at the end of this life, that's the only thing you'll regret. You won't regret, I wish I bought a bigger car. I wish my house had a bigger living room. No, you'll regret, man, I wish I shared my faith more. And look at this passage as we end. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Here's what I want to say. What this is saying is, before Jesus comes back, and, and only until then, everybody will have an opportunity to believe in Jesus. So guess what? What are we supposed to do today? Start that process as early as possible. Do you share your faith? When's the last time you told somebody that Jesus Christ loved them, died on the cross for them, and they can have forgiveness if they put their faith in him? If it's been too long, then guess what? It's been too long. Let's do it so that we can save as many people from the hell on earth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, wow, 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 this is heavy. I can feel the heaviness, and I'm sure everybody here can feel the heaviness. But it's true, and it's in the Bible, and we need to know it. I pray that your plan will accomplish everything that it will accomplish, and I know it will. And I pray those of us who are already convinced Christians will share our faith like crazy. Share our faith like crazy. Invite people to church. Hey, if you're afraid to share your faith, invite them here. I'll share the faith. But if you haven't known Jesus Christ on a personal level, please do not delay. I beg of you. I'll, do, I'll stand on my head and spit up jelly beans if you want me to. Just say, Jesus Christ, you are a holy God. I am a sinful human being. You died on the cross to bridge the gap between your holiness and my sinfulness. I believe it. I receive it by faith now. And if you say it and mean it to God directly, he's heard you. And you're a Christian. Let us know so we can support you in starting your new faith. Father, thank you that you're a righteous God and that all that happens, good or bad, 
is your righteousness displayed and help us to be ready for this period. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if scripture can be any more clear than what we just heard, but I want you to understand something. It's not a scare tactic. God is not doing this to scare someone into submission. God is doing this, as Pastor Vince had alluded to in his head, because he loves you. And so many different things happen because of this. And, and I, the reason that we spend so much time on this, the reason that we talk about it, the reason that we constantly say this every single week about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is because we firmly believe that this is the most important decision that you can ever make in your entire life. And it may not feel that way, given your current circumstances. But knowing that your eternity is secure, knowing that the God of the universe loves you, this is not a decision to make lightly. We know that, we wanna help you through it. And we want you to tell us about it because this is not something you wanna keep secret because just because you place your faith in Jesus, nobody ever said life gets easy. It just becomes clear. And we wanna help you through that process. Here's what I want you to do. If you have prayed that prayer, if you're here in person or if you're watching online, I want you to do something very specific. I want you to take out the app that we talked about, click the connect button. Let us know that you made that first time faith commitment. This is not for us to check off a box. This is not for us to accomplish a task. This is us helping you, fulfilling the mission that this church has been called to do to help you walk on that spiritual journey, to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ and to share that news with everyone you come in contact with because of the grace and mercy that we see. So let us know about that. We wanna help you through this. If it maybe this just stirred something up and you got something on your heart and you need prayer, our team is gonna be up here right after service. Please come straight up. They will be here. They will talk to you. They will pray for you. Sometimes we just don't even have the words to say. Let them say it for you. Now listen, we say this every week and we mean this from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you guys so much for how you've partnered with us, for your generosity. If you've come prepared to worship through your tithes and offerings, it's a great time in the service to do that. Uh, we have multiple different ways out in the atrium as well. But it's because of that that we're able to just continue week in, week out, share the gospel of Jesus Christ and hopefully help you grow in your faith. This was a heavy morning, but not in that bad way, but just really here's how scripture lays it out. Here's what God's plan is. Here's what that's gonna look like. We know that Jesus Christ is the only one who can make the darkness tremble. That he is the only one who offers the forgiveness of sins. And as this is kind of stirring in our minds, stirring in our hearts, I wanna invite us to stand one last time. We're gonna to end today's service in a posture of worship because we know how powerful his name truly is. So church, as one voice, let's sing this out together.
much for being here, everybody. Have an awesome week.